especially since it's so nice today and tonight, we have great weather out. Um, but tonight is the October 21st regular public meeting of ANC 34G. We have a pretty packed agenda. Um, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order now at 7.06 and start with commissioner introductions going from my left to right. And then I believe we got one commissioner online. Commissioner Lynch. My name is Peter Lynch. I represent SMD 05. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Can I say that all over again? Yeah. Michael Zeldin, 3G04, which is Lafayette Elementary and its immediate environments. And I want to say thanks for having me as uh, commissioner. My term ends with the upcoming November election. And then I will be here for the last two meetings, which are lame duck meetings. Peter will be the, be the same, right? Um, but so thanks. It's been a pleasure. Hi, I'm Peter Gosselin. Uh, I represent District 6, which is largely the west side of Connecticut, back to Friendship Heights. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gore. I'm commissioner for ANC 34G01, which is Hawthorne and portions of Barnaby Woods. And I'm going to work till the end. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm James Nash from single member district 03, the southeasternmost part of our ANC. And I am Bruce Sherman, uh, commissioner for district 02. Commissioner Ferguson, are you online? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, Zach Ferguson for single member district 07. I'm also the treasurer. All right. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so in terms of meeting procedures, again, we have a really packed agenda for tonight. We have a couple of issues that are hot issues that came up at the very last minute that we have to get on the agenda um, and some things that we already had scheduled. I'm going to ask that um, commissioners and non-commissioners, residents and attendants, limit talk time to a minute and a half to make sure that we get through our agenda timely. I ask that folks that are online use the raise your hand feature so that we can elevate you to speak. For those in person, um, come to the center mic uh, when you want to speak. And I would ask for everyone when our time is up on the agenda item to please be respectful of the meeting time and let's move on to the next agenda item. We'll do our best to get everyone in um, on these topics. And um, some of them hopefully will carry over to the next meeting. With that, in terms of changes to the agenda, um, one of the things that I'm gonna ask is that commissioners, we remove the presentation on Lead Free DC initiative scheduled for 820. Um, that we add, presentation by Commissioner Nash um, on the remaining Transportation Committee survey, uh, which we said we would give him 10 minutes. And let's see, adding um, present or discussion led by Commissioner Sherman on ANC authority. And I believe we said we would give that presentation 15 minutes. Any other changes to the agenda? Uh, I have a, a suggestion for a change. Um, I would like to see us table at least one of uh, Commissioner Ferguson's uh, 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 proposed resolutions that show up on the agenda here at, at eight o'clock, uh, the one uh, in support of protected bike lanes. Um, I think that uh, uh, Zach and I have talked about this and uh, he, uh, he believe that uh, all none of these three proposed uh, resolutions would be uh, controversial. I have some problems with bike lane proposal, and I think it would be best we'd be best served, particularly in terms of time, if we put that off until the next meeting. Also, I'd like to say I'm happy to support 
uh, the 15 minutes for the discussion of the uh, ANC authorities issue. But as I've asked in our internal email back and forth, which run now to who knows how many pages, uh, I want to be sure I ask uh, 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 Commissioner Sherman to be sure to leave other commissioners time to comment on the issue and if necessary on your comments about the issue. Do I have that assurance? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, um, I'd, like, I'd like to suggest in furtherance to Commissioner Gosselin's proposal to table one of the resolutions that Zach has proposed that given that we have three more meetings this year and given the press of other business tonight that we do one tonight, one next month and one in December. Um, the, the, the one that we would do tonight besides the protected bike lanes issue, that's already been proposed to be tabled. We could, Zach could advise which one he would prefer to prioritize for tonight. But we do have two more meetings and it seems to me that unless these have a certain urgency, these are not great weight resolutions as I understand it, that we just do them one at each of the next three meetings. Okay, I'll come back to that. I um, also wanna remove commissioners the discussion and possible vote on the BZA application, Commissioner Zeldin, we're pushing that till November, right? Okay. Um, in terms of the resolutions by Commissioner Ferguson, um, as chair, he has 15 minutes on the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson said that he would take each resolution in order from least controversial. We're probably not going to get through all three. I really don't see a need to table any of them when 15 minutes is up. As I stated before, 15 minutes is up. We have to move on. Um, my suggestion is let Commissioner Ferguson introduce the resolutions as he said he would, one at a time, and we discuss and vote on each one. And uh, whatever we don't get finished in that 15 minute um, time frame, then we're going to have to roll it over to the next meeting. That would be my my you know my suggestion to the commission. Uh, my uh, proposal to table the bike lane resolution stands. Okay, Commissioner. So the motion on the floor is to add conversation the um, presentation by Commissioner Nash, 15, ten minutes, to add presentation by Commissioner Sherman, fifteen minutes, to remove presentation on lead free DC, to remove discussion and possible vote on BZA application. Is there a second? Second. Commissioners, all those in favor, raise your hand. Are we going to take up my proposal separately? We can. Well, okay. I'm I'm voting for it on, on the understanding that we take up my proposal. I'm sorry, what are we voting on? I'm, I'm also voting for it, accepting Commissioner Goslin's proposed amendment. We have conflicting proposals from Commissioner Sherman and Goslin. We're going to we're going to address that. Let me get through the okay. vote. Commissioner Ferguson, how are you voting on my Okay. So yeah. that's 7-0. So, um Commissioner Goslin and Sherman, your motions or your proposals are conflicting. Um one of you are asking to table everything and one is asking to table just one resolution. I think actually Commissioner Sherman proposed tabling two of the three and leaving it to Commissioner Ferguson to choose which of the one we debate. Okay, so we that's could take this, we could take, uh, Look, well, you want to simplify this? Fine. I'll, yeah. I'll go with Commissioner Sherman's proposal and table two uh, uh, of the three and leave it to Commissioner Ferguson to decide which one we debate on. Is that a fair rendition of what you're proposing? So, um, commissioners, the motion is to table two resolutions from Commissioner Sherman's presentation, and what, I mean wait, Commissioner what, Ferguson's what, presentation, and to allow Commissioner Ferguson to determine which remaining resolution he will present. Just a point of order to table two, one of which is the bike lane one. Uh, <laughs> he can choose which of the other two he wants to bring forward. Sure, can I uh, speak to the motion? Sure. Yeah, so I prefer to speak for myself rather than, you know, um, Commissioner Gosselin's conveyance of what he believes I believe. Um, I sent these resolutions around a month ago. Uh, we've had them at the 
uh, transportation committee meeting. We've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback. Um, I have not heard anything on the merits from any commissioner and opposed. I'm I'm happy to you know take the 15 minutes uh, and take them one at a time. And you know if uh, I'm happy to table the bike lane one uh, at the end. But um, you know I I. I object to, you know, I've given a lot of notice. Most of our resolutions are not great weight. I believe the BZA is the only one that's pretty normal that we don't have great weight resolutions. And I have have not, um, you know, I, I gave a month notice and provide a lot of community feedback. I, I don't know why uh, we couldn't have the 15 minutes and see where we get. Okay, right, commissioners, any other discussion? Everybody understand what we're voting on? We're voting on table number two. Yes, yeah. one of which is a bike lane. Okay, all those in favor, can you show by raise a hand? One, two, three. Three, all those opposed, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, fails. Okay. Let's move forward on our agenda. Just to be clear, if we don't get the bike lane is coming third. The bike lane is coming third. If we don't get enough time for it in the 15 minutes allocated, mm -hmm. that'll just automatically roll yeah. over. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of the consent agenda, <clears throat> we have the minutes, which I don't know if we have received from September 23rd. They are in draft. I'll send them around. They're not finalized. Okay, so yeah. we're going to remove that from the consent agenda. And only thing on the consent agenda is a reimbursement for Commissioner Ferguson for $112.50 for Luis Chica. Um, commissioners, any um, discussion on the consent agenda? Nope. All those uh, are Chair, were you, were you going to include on the consent agenda the um, engagement program to have that just be approved that way. I thought that was so the engagement Local, software. Local, yeah, yeah, yeah. As yeah. opposed to having a discussion of it, mm -hmm. since we've already talked about it. So, is everybody okay with that? I sent an email around. I didn't really get a lot of responses. Are we okay with putting the engagement software on the consent agenda for approval? And it was two thousand dollars. Right. This is for the go. This is for the go vocal. Uh... We talked about go vocal and district engage. I think either one. We're just putting aside the money. In yes. This. Okay, fine. Okay. I'm fine. Yeah. So we'll add that on there too. Thank you, Commissioner Sherman. Okay. All those in favor, commissioners, raise your hand. Okay. Commissioner Ferguson, how do you vote? I abstain because I'm uh, being reimbursed. You're abstaining? Right, because my reimbursement's on there. Okay. Six zero one. Thank you. Okay, A and C resident form. This is a portion of the agenda where if community members have questions, comments, or concerns for the A and C on items that are not on the agenda, um, this is a form where you can discuss that. Um, if anyone is in person and has an item they wanna raise, please come to the mic. If you are um, virtual, please raise your hand. And I'm going to go with virtual first because you put your hand up real quick. Nat. Thanks. So this is the community. Do you want to confirm this is the community engagement part, the agenda? This is the uh, resident form. Yeah, yeah, this is where the res where residents have an opportunity to bring up issues with the ANC that are not on the agenda. Okay. I will, I will raise, drop my hand because I'm for the community later. Okay. Robin. It's on top. There are two switches. So it Thank you. Okay. I'd like to bring you up to date on the trends in the DC public library system regarding what is proposed for the civic core here. I think uh, many of you know me, my name is Robin Diener. I'm the director of the Library Renaissance Project, which was founded by Ralph Nader in 2002 to protect and promote the public interest in the library. We oppose the privatization of public land. 
Uh, Ralph effectively launched what became what the Board of Library Trustees has dubbed the Library Transformation, which is the greatest civic project in DC history. Uh, to date, 21 out of 26 of our public libraries have been fully rebuilt or renovated. The only library property to have been subject to a public-private partnership, such as that which proposed for Chevy Chase, was the West End, where we had, of course, you all know, the terrible debacle of the flood, which was widely predicted, and um, the uh, Board of Library Trustees has agreed to do a report on what happened, but they haven't done it yet because public-private partnerships don't work. And now the rental part of the building has been sold. We'll never find out what happened. Two other libraries were initially proposed for PPP, MLK and the Southwest Library. MLK even had an international design um, competition. But ultimately, the trustees decided it was not cost effective and that there would be a public outcry. A minute 30 is up. Pardon? Your time's up. I'm up? Yes. <laughs> if you want. Um, so $212 million was ultimately spent to renovate MLK. It's won all kinds of awards. Everyone loves it. Another library scheduled for a PPP was Southwest. The community there totally opposed that. Uh, their uh, council member heeded their wishes. And the Friends of the Library, an active group there, which is not here, also worked with the ANC very well. And instead of being stuck in under a big building, it's where it was before. It's a freestanding building across from a beautiful park, not unlike what you have here. Now you can join the friends of the Chevy Chase Library. They'll take your money, but that's it. And you won't get any form of communication from them. Now beyond housing, Chevy Chase is also proposed for co-location with community center. This is the opposite of what is being done to the co-located libraries in DC. We have four. They are all scheduled to be severed from what they're co-located with. Deanwood is getting a 20,000 square foot freestanding library. Congress Heights replacing Parklands Turner, a freestanding 20,000 square foot library. Northwest One and Rosedale, it's not definite what they're gonna do, but that's the proposal to sever them from their co-locations. So please, look, go see the Southwest Library. You won't be able to believe how beautiful it is if you haven't seen it already. And so I don't know why Chevy Chase should have to lose 5,000 square feet from your library, be co-located, which is shown in the history of DC Public Libraries, not to work, and have housing when the community said they didn't want it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. People say their names. Good evening. My name is Claudia Russell. And I have a simple question. When will the ANC SMD map be updated? We have an election. If you go online, it's still not updated. What did you say? The map that shows the SMDs within our ANC. It is vastly out of date. We have People have stopped me when I've been on the street. What SMD do I, am I in? If I get on my phone, I can't tell them. Some, some people are new and, you know, this is, baffling and we're in an election year and we have known so I, it. let me address that just for general public you can go online to find my anc put in your address and that will tell you which anc you're located in we also um just contracted with a web designer we are not web designers Mm -hmm. I don't know WordPress, neither do any of these guys. So we had actually our website crash today. I know. And it came, so, sorry. so we do not want people in there tinkering with something that they do not know about. Um, the person that is revamping our website is going to get to that. Okay. But in the meantime, if anybody needs to know what ANC they're located in, definitely have them reach out to a commissioner or very easy, find my ANC. Could you put that on the map and say that the map is out of date and the best way to locate is that information? Because people are, people have asked. I yeah. I don't want to update. I don't, well, we'll look at it and we'll I think see. Because be we, I think the link is in there. We can make sure that we add the link in there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. We, we can also, to that point, I think, make a posting on Chevy Chase, listserv, yeah. um, Google, and Facebook, and we'll just do that because those 
cover many people in addition to your suggestion. Yep, thank you. Hey, I've got, more. my name's Steve Connors. I got just a couple of things that are just um, kind of questions about when things might get fixed, but uh, is it Mr. Gosselin, are you the commissioner that oversees this building? No. Who no, is? Maybe. You do? Yeah. Uh, can you put on your list, could you contact somebody to get the flashing on the corner of the building fixed? It's It's been raining for, you know, I mean, back in the summer, but it's been almost a year and a half. Flashing's getting worse. Water's getting in there, birds, who knows? Other thing, somebody mentioned a couple of weeks ago, why can't we get a nice flagpole with, with two new American flags? Is it that hard to do? I mean, and what is the budget? Why are you laughing, Peter? The, ma the maintenance of this building is a very, very sad thing. If you go to the second floor, the skylight in the middle it's leaking. That's it's what been I mean. leaking so for four, the four years I've been a commissioner, and there's a bucket under it. Uh, so, I know, but let's just get it fixed. So, uh, otherwise, we're going to wait years to get this whole thing redeveloped. Why on, not just fix it? On, the other on, thing is on the so so like, on the flagpole. Hard to hear you because on the flagpole, it took me about eighteen months to get a new flag in front of Lafayette Elementary School. So, what's the, uh, the, uh, the, there's a flag in in front of the. On, 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 no, I'm saying in aluminum flag. Other things. So those are just minor. I'm just things. saying it take all these things take time. Um, Maybe we should have a GoFundMe effort. The other thing was you want to start it. Thing, Go ahead. The other thing was I noticed that some mm -hmm. of the thing that the budget for the ANC is quite large right now, sixty-two thousand oh, dollars or is it forty-two thousand dollars? So my other question was with all these funds, a how are they going to be spent, That's what and can we possibly like look at? beautifying our tree boxes. I mean, look at the Avalon Theater, look at the Magruder's. I mean, nobody takes care of those things and they're just a dump. It's an eyesore. I mean, there's graffiti on the minute, Avalon minute Theater. Minute so. These things can be addressed. Can I ask okay. you? I, I mean, and, and then also one of the last questions. Was, You're actually out of time. We are, we have uh, got to get through a lot of our agenda. We have two people. Okay. Uh, so I would my ask question, that you. My last question is, can somebody okay, monitor so the paving system? It's your district. The paving in our area is a pathetic. Okay. Go on. Chair Gore, uh, Brian Heilman, Bruce Sherman's SMD. Um, at the last... Uh, ANC meeting in September, uh, and Chair Gore, I think you were not there at that particular meeting. Um, there was a proposal to uh, create a resolution to preserve the Julian Bond Memorial Bench. Uh, Julian Bond, president of the NAACP for more than 10 years, a resident of Chevy Chase for uh, almost three decades. Um, I think it's non-controversial to preserve his legacy bench here at the uh, at the community center, and I've sent a res uh, proposed resolution to Bruce, and and then one to you tonight, uh, Chair Gore. And I'm hoping that next uh, next meeting it can be passed without uh, without any further discussion. So, asking uh, Demped and OP and the mayor's office to preserve the Julian Bond. Right. So, bench. as soon as the resolution is presented to the ANC by the commissioner that's sponsoring it, we'll take it up. Great. Okay. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I just have a comment. My name's Eli Robinson. I just moved to the neighborhood. This is my first ANC meeting. I am in uh, Mr. Goslin's uh, district. We had a chance to have lunch a few months ago. And uh, anybody out there online or in person who's, uh, you know, a little bit less seasoned than the standard people who visit ANC meetings, come on. I'd like to meet you. Like, I just wanted to say hi and thank you guys because uh, just moved to the neighborhood and you guys are doing a great job. So I appreciate Welcome. it. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I got it. Um, Simon Marks online. Thanks, Commissioner Gore. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, barely, barely. Let me get a bit closer to the mic. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, as I think the, the, the commissioners know, I am very exercised on behalf of the people, uh, the residents of the Connecticut and military area stretching up to Jennifer Street about the overnight construction that has been taking place by DC Water. Hopefully that first phase of the overnight construction is coming to an end. But uh, as I've made clear in various uh, fora, uh, it is absolutely apparent that DDOT and DC Water flagrantly disregarded the ANC uh, flagrantly disregarded the council member 
uh, flagrantly disregarded the Ward 3 Mayor's Office on Community Relations, engaged in no notification about those overnight works, no consultation whatsoever, and may have inappropriately uh, obtained the permit for the overnight work. No one seems to be able to find out how that permit was uh, given and whether proper processes were followed. My question is, what are we going to do? What is the ANC going to do uh, to hold DDOT and DC Water accountable, especially given that phase two of the project is due to begin soon, include construction work on Military Road, Kanawa, Jennifer and Jocelyn, and there seems to be no information whatsoever yet about permitting for that project, uh, and the fear of residents is that once again, the ANC will not be consulted, not be notified, neither will the council member, even as DC Water on its website claims that it is in communication and consultation with all of those uh, those various bodies. So Commissioner Ferguson, do you wanna, th first of all, thank you, Simon. Um, thank you for the emails. And we've been working with you, um, Council Member Fruman's office, <laughs> DC Water, uh, everyone to try to get some resolution to the area uh, residents in that area. I'm gonna let Commissioner Ferguson kind of give an update. Um, and hopefully that'll answer your questions. Yeah, um, I was going to mention this in my uh, commissioner announcements because it's probably the uh, the noisiest thing in my SMD. Um, if you haven't heard the noise at night, you're very lucky because it is loud machinery. They're doing very heavy work in the middle of the night. It's been very difficult to get answers from DC Water. They have not been. I've called. I've emailed. You know they've. Um, the, what we've heard latest from the really the council member, Matt Fruman has been out there multiple nights and he's organizing a meeting, community meeting with DC Water later this month. Um, so we hope to get some chance to engage with DC Water at a community meeting and hear what they have to say for themselves because this is project, even if this section is done uh, one more night or two more nights, there's many more sections to go. Anyone can go on the TOPS website and see these permits. They're all over our, you know, there's everything ranging from a block party to overnight construction work. And you can just see almost, you know, I'd say maybe over a hundred permits now and upcoming, and they don't really tell you much, you know, there's, there's minimal language. So it's not like, even if you look at the permit, you don't really have a good idea of what it's going to be. Um, but I think that's what I'm looking towards is this community meeting to see what the ANC could pass in terms of a resolution about um, what DC Water says and how we can better get engagement. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So we'll definitely be in touch on that. I'm gonna move to um, commissioner announcements. Um, commissioners, I have two announcements. Anyone else? Okay, we'll go down from my right going on down. Commissioner Sherman. Uh, I'd like to announce that on Wednesday at the University of Virginia Medical School, my constituent, uh, Dr. Vivian Penn, is going to be honored. They're going to have the unveiling of her portrait um, she was the uh, second uh, uh, black woman graduate of the University of Virginia Medical School in 1967. Uh, she went on to uh, be the first head of the Department of Pathology at Howard University Medical School. Uh, she was the first director of the Women's Institute at the National Institutes of Health. She was the second woman president of the American Medical Association. And she uh, has a building named after her at the University of Virginia. Uh, again, Vivian Penn, it's the Penn Building, but this is going to unveil her portrait, her official portrait. It's going to happen on Wednesday. I put it out in my newsletter that went out uh, this afternoon with the live stream link. Uh, I will do a listserv post as well, so everybody who's interested can watch the unveiling of the portrait. Um, she lives on Unicorn Lane in Chatsworth. She's been a longtime resident of the, uh, of the district. And I'm very pleased to make this announcement about her and very proud of her wonderful career. Awesome. Thank you. Commissioner Nash? Yeah. Uh, oops. Yeah, this is an announcement from uh, the, the bus transit working group they wanted me to make. The, the announcement is to request or challenge all commissioners to go one week without driving. This is something I did recently. 
And I can tell you, I learned quite a bit, although it doesn't matter. You know, it's not a head thing. It's actually living it. Uh, and the reason is many of your constituents, they say, cannot drive. Uh, they may be disabled, they may be too old, they may be too young, they may not be able to afford a car. How will you be able to serve them unless you live their lives at least for a week? Okay, that, that's my announcement. Oh, and I, I did it. If you have any questions, please talk to me. I'll tell you about it. Great, thank you. Um, commissioners, any announcements on this end? Commissioner Nash, I mean, Ferguson. Uh, I think I've got a resident who is, does he want to speak for, um, do we have any, I, think, I thought we had one more resident who wants to speak at the open forum. Do we have anyone? Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Ferguson, this is Matt Mason. I'd, I'd like to address the forum if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, just give me one, uh, one second. I'm, uh, I, I, I prepared some remarks um and um um nope. yeah here we go um i i prepared some remarks because i wanted to be uh short and succinct um so here we go um i've been in many meetings where the anc works hard to hold the department of buildings to account and enforce its mandate Tonight, I present the other side of the coin, that is an inspection office of DOB that is unwilling to codify the necessary steps to achieve final inspection. On October 8th, an inspector from the Department of Buildings arrived at my home to conduct our final inspection after 26 months of construction. The inspector quickly retorted, you're not ready for inspection and unnecessarily remarked to my trusted contractor, do you want me to make your final punch list? At issue in my home are four missing stair treads needed before we can complete a permanent stair railing. All other inspections have passed and we maintain a positive constructive relationship with our contractor. The big problem I'm having is my bank will not release the final tranche of funding until DOB conducts its inspection. And I can't receive a partial, um, so in, until DOB conducts its final inspection. Um, and last, I'll say I chose to have DOB conduct all of my inspections because I wanted a disinterested third party that would not rubber stamp inspections. To date, they have been that third party, and I've been very appreciative of that. But this final inspection comes at a pivotal time where I need the inspection in order to release funding. My ask, or at least uh, to, to socialize this with the Department of Buildings, is to compel the DOB to conduct their final inspection. Uh, codify any DC building codes violations per the DC building code, and don't walk away simply and state, quote, you're not ready and refuse to conduct the inspection, which is what happened. If violations are found, return in a reasonable amount of time to confirm they have been corrected. Case closed. And then last is don't be vindictive because this happens. Enforce the code, but don't move the proverbial goalposts. Thank you for your time. And um, I appreciate your attention. What was your name? My name is Matt Mason. I live on Huntington Street. Thank you. And you, you Who's your commissioner? We you might remember we unanimously passed his BZA application um, last year. Okay. He's your constituent, Zach? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. All Thank right. you. D did you have any further announcements, Commissioner Ferguson? No, I'm happy. To, I, I've got other things, but that that's great. And I, um, I'll let others go ahead. Thanks. Okay. So I just have one announcement from Frazier or Leary, our Ward 4 Board of Education rep. Um, he'll be testifying on October 29th about the teacher retention and mentoring of new teachers. If the community would like to testify um, on a, November 15th about cell phones in schools, let him know. He is also still collecting books for K through eight, K through eight graders. Um, there is an email that I'll put in the chat along with his um, 
phone number and address where you can drop books off. Um, my second announcement is um, I will ask the commissioners to approve the letter that I sent around calling on a joint roundtable and oversight to discuss tenant safety issues. Um, and in brief, this letter is from chairs of ANC 3C, 3F, and 34G. So myself, Janelle Paggetts, and um, oh my gosh, I forgot, Commissioner Carlson. And it basically requests the council members on housing, health, and facilities, and family services to hold a joint roundtable oversight hearing to discuss tenant safety issues in apartment buildings along um, Connecticut Avenue. Recently, there have been two child fatalities in the space of a week, one in ANC 3C and one in ANC 3F, and the impact particularly on the Merch community whose kindergartners lost a classmate is profound. Our ANCs have been um, hearing from constituents that there are not available social services for those who are requesting them. Council is responsible for oversight of agencies that are responsible for, for providing care and services to those in need. ANCs 3C, F, and 34G are requesting the communities that oversee the rel committees that oversee the relevant agencies to call an oversight hearing. So that is basically what the letter directs. Are there any questions on that, Commissioner? I just want to speak in favor of it. Uh, a number of commissioners here attended a meeting of 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 3C, uh, 3F, 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 3F last last week. I mean, it's just heartbreaking what's happened to these kids, and and at least part of the problem is the lack of services. So um, I hope we can approve it. Commissioner Lynch. Yeah, I already sent a note to Councilmember Fruman about this, but one of the issues which came up in a Ward 3 Education Network meeting is that uh, specifically at Merch, the special education staff uh, is stretched thin. So they are often alongside teachers, some of the first people to notice the red flags, which could be raised to protect against something along these lines. So if you're open to it, uh, including strengthening special education and teacher supports within that letter, uh, I think would go a long way. But thank you for writing it, it's, it's important. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Okay, commissioners. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Is, is Peter's proposed language be? I will suggest. I can't amend it myself. This was a. This is three chairs. I will recommend. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. Yep, I'll recommend it. Okay. All right. Commissioners, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Seven zero. All right. So our next got, agenda item is discussion. We've got one more community announcement. Okay. Virtual. Is that Nate? Nat? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Nat Cohen. I'm a volunteer for the Yes for 83 ballot initiative, and I've been asked to provide some information about uh, the initiative. Um, so initiative 83 is on the back of your ballot. <clears throat> so be sure to turn your ballot over in order to vote about the initiative. And initiative 83 has two parts. One is to adopt ranked choice voting for primary, special, and general elections for government offices. And the other proposal is to adopt semi-open primaries. This allows voters who are not affiliated with any party to vote in the party primary of their choice. Um, the current method of electing candidates called plurality voting often does not accomplish the most basic function of a democracy, which is to ensure that the person elected to represent their constituents has majority support under plurality voting, especially when there are many candidates running. The winner could be a candidate who is strongly opposed by the majority of their constituents. The ranked choice voting fixes this defect by ensuring that the candidate with majority support is elected. Washington, D.C. also has a large population of journalists, academics, and nonpartisan who work at, or sorry, people who work at nonpartisan nonprofits who do not wish to be affiliated, publicly affiliated with any um, political party. That's uh, nearly one in six voters are non affiliated. And since, according to the Post, as, DC, as the Washington Post puts it, D.C. is overwhelmingly blue 
the Democratic Party has become the de facto election. Um, Non-affiliated people, voters are effectively um, unable to participate meaningfully in primary, in, in electing, in electing thank, their representatives. Thank you, Nat. Your time is actually up. If you have a link that you could put in the chat, that would help in case you didn't get through your discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. My chat is disabled, but yes, on 83.org mm -hmm. is, a, is a link to people can go to. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Maybe Louise can open up the chat for us. Um, so now we are going to have a discussion with MPD Second District. Our commander is here. Um, how are you, Commander Savoy? If you'd like to come forward, as well as a commander Bagshaw from um, the Special Operations Division, we asked them, or I asked them, to come tonight because we have been having a series of protests in Barnaby Woods um, at a particular residence since roughly June. And some of you may be aware, some of you might not be aware, but um, I've been dealing with uh, the community on some issues there regarding this for a while and had an opportunity to actually go on site when the protest was in full swing. And um, it was definitely um, you know, a little concerning, some of the things that occurred. And uh, we asked MPD to come and I know Commander, uh, you've reached out to some of the residents there and had some conversations. There's a list of questions. Um, I would ask if uh, Meredith, I don't see you, Meredith, if you're on the line. Oh, there you are. <laughs> How are you? I didn't know if you were coming in person. Okay. So we do have some of the residents from Barnaby Woods here. I would ask if you guys want to speak. I want you guys to speak first um, so that we can get your perception on the record. And then, Commander, if you don't mind speaking behind them and your staff, you want to introduce yourselves first? Okay, thank you. Hold on. Okay, hi, everyone. Should, maybe I should turn this way. You can. This, okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Tatiana Savoy. I'm the commander here of the second district. Um, I did bring some some uh, of my co-workers with me. We have some members from our executive staff here. We have Chief Carlos Harrard from the Homeland Security. He oversees Homeland Security. And then I have Assistant Chief Sylvan R. Terry, who is the current Assistant Chief for Patrol Services North. Uh, that includes districts two, three, four, and five. And then I also have Commander Jason Bagshaw, who oversees our Special Operations Division, which we know as SOD. And of course we have Captain, <laughs> Captain Darren Hask is here with us as well. So did you want to start with maybe Meredith come up and-, and Yeah, your question Meredith, if you don't mind. Okay. Just turn it. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Meredith Hobick. I live in Barnaby Woods. Uh, shout out to the police and Lisa Gore. Thank you for your service and helping the neighbors. Um, since around June, there's been anywhere from five to 12 protesters that park at Tennyson in Utah, and then they walk down the street um, and they intimidate, harass, and target a particular private residence. Um, without getting into what the topics are, because freedom of speech is important, everyone has a right to protest, but it's very uncomfortable in the neighborhood to see one federal government employee's office or home being targeted. Um, it's impacting all of our quality of life. Um, you could hear the noise, it's on um, amplified sound machines and you can hear it about three quarters of a mile away. So we're looking for answers on, you know, what does a peaceful protest look like, targeting residents, um, and what we can do as a neighborhood to support this family and get back to more peaceful living on the streets. Did you want to start with your questions, Meredith? I know you had a list of questions, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, come and on. if you would come like to speak, ma'am, just come on forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, at a high level, we're trying to understand, can you target a private residence, noise amplification, blocking streets, um, uh, coordinated protests, do you need to alert MPD in advance? 
Um, I think those were the high level ones. Permit. Oh, permit. Mm -hmm. Permit. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Abrahams. Um, I also live in Barnaby Woods, and I contacted um, Mr. Sherman about um, the noise. Um, I don't live ex right next to the house in question, but I walk my dogs early in the morning. Um, and also the noises, I, it sounds like it's coming in my living room. I think the protesters um, are harassing, intimidating. Um, as a lawyer, I actually looked up the code section, and I'm sort of dismayed that it's so open-ended that it seems to suggest to me that anyone can target anyone's house for any particular reason. Um, anyone can, you, you know, I may not, um, uh, I'm a Yankee fan. If the Dodgers, somebody has Dodgers decorations, and I want to protest in front of their house, as long as it's between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., um, I can do that, and if and and if it's fewer than five hundred people, I don't apparently need a permit. Um, and I, I just, I, you know, for for the ANC, it's it's difficult for me to understand how it is possible that we can target residents, um, particular residents, or just a, you know, a, a, frankly, a neighborhood more generally. Um, I'm just really mildly disgusted. I, I'm also very concerned, frankly, um, as someone who, um, how shall I say this politely, is at odds with what the protesters are particularly um, uh, protesting about, um, the substance of it. Um, I, I think that, that I, I sort of got a little disgusted this past weekend because I think, you know, in terms of intimidation, um, the language and what they were chanting actually got a little sort of over the top and really spoke to the whole notion of a Jewish free Palestine, um, which to me is intimidating. It, it's arguably inciting violence. And for those of us in the neighborhood who happen to be Jewish, I think that it's particularly concerning. So I, I you know, in addition to all of the questions already raised, um, those are my questions. But I also, I guess my broader question is, whether in fact, I know the law has re was changed some number of years ago um, more broadly, but I wonder if there's an opportunity to change the law to restrict what actually goes on in the residential communities. Um, you know, apparently it's not just a public official you can target, you mm -hmm. can target just about anyone for any reason. Mm -hmm. So that's my concern mm -hmm. that I wanted to raise. Okay, thank you. And um, so, yeah, approach the mic. And I'll just add in terms of, um, I've talked with some of the neighbors there, and one of the things that really struck me is one of the neighbors said that one of the neighbors said that when the protesters come, it gets so bad and so loud, they actually take their kids out of the house through the back door. Um, so it is, you know, you can imagine going through this since June. Um, and I, I can address, and Meredith, maybe you can too, your question on the legislation, because we've been looking at that. Okay, go on. Uh, I live on Barnaby Street. I'm a few houses away from Van Hazen, um, and I guess I'm the opposing view here. I, uh, and maybe it's because I have some sympathy for what the demonstrators are saying. I certainly agree they're loud. Um, no question about that. Uh, but uh, when I've talked to them, they've been polite to me and I've been polite to them. And um, I, I don't know what the rules are. Uh, they should follow the rules, whatever they are. Thank you. Okay. And online, Tricia, Commissioner hey. Duncan. Um, my name is Tricia Duncan. I'm from ANC 3D, but I had gotten a note in the chat from Hope Cousins, the Ward 3 Moker, and she wanted to speak but was unable to raise her hand. Huh. But when she's done, I do have a, a comment, but maybe you could call on Miss Cousin. Okay. Hope? Hi, can you hear and see me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, a couple of things. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Duncan for that, um, for letting everyone know that. 
Um, a couple of things. First, to Mr. Marks, please. Oh, know can you introduce yourself? Your title. Oh. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. For those of you who don't know me, I'm my name is Hope Cousin and I'm the Ward 3 Mokers Manager. Um, and, and what that means is that I'm basically the eyes and ears of the mayor. So if you have any concerns going on through your SMD, ANC, what have you, please let me know and I will address it as quickly as I can. I will put my information in the chat when I'm done, um, but I definitely wanted to speak on a couple of things that I heard prior, and I'll keep it brief because I know it's a packed agenda. Um, for Mr. Mark, Simon Marks, please know, um, I definitely want to extend apologies on behalf of what's happening with DC Water. Um, I'm very much aware I've gotten the emails and phone calls, and frankly, I would be upset too if, Jack hammering and things of that nature were going on from about this time until five in the morning. Um, when I spoke with Emmanuel Briggs at DC Water, I was told that the project was to be wrapped up last week. Um, so I have reached out to him. I haven't received any feedback as of yet, but after hearing some of the concerns that I've heard earlier, I have every intention of doing so immediately after this meeting. Also, in regards to the so. children's deaths um, in 3C and 3F, I unfortunately, um, I was there um, when they took the father away. It was very disturbing, as you could imagine, to children's death, deaths within two weeks of each other, within a few blocks of each other, and apparently because under suspicious circumstances. So um, please know that the mayor's office is very much aware of this. I have made some recommendations in regards to various services that I think would be helpful. So um, if anyone would like to chime in and, and help and things of that nature by way of recommendations, please reach out to me. Um, the mayor definitely loves her seniors and she loves her children. Um, this was very disturbing indeed. Um, and on a more positive note. Um, hey, Hope. Yes. I got I to gotta interject. Yes. Are your rest of your comments on this topic? Because we got to get through this MP. No, 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 no. No, I'll put the rest. No, you are perfectly fine. And I appreciate your letting me chime in. I'll put the rest of what I was going to say. It was on leaf collection, but I can pop it in the chat. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Thank you. No, for sure. Okay. Any okay. other residents have comments on the it, protest topic? Commissioner please? Gore, can I make yes. a comment on the protests? Sure. So um, I appreciate Commander Savoy and Captain Haskett's being there, but uh, we pull a lot of permits in ANC 3D. And it is my understanding that to have amplified sound on the streets of DC, you need a permit. It doesn't matter how many people you have in your protest. If you have amplified sound, you need a permit. Is that not true? Um, and I, I, I perhaps would like to hear a comment on that because uh, I, I run through hoops pulling per permits with DC. And this seems like not just one off of amplified sound, but like days and weeks of amplified sound and I just I just want to know what the law is here. All right, Commander, you're up. Or okay, you gonna take it? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Chief Arad, uh, Assistant Chief of the Homeland Security Bureau. The Special Operations Division falls under me, which is led by Commander Bagshaw, and they deal with all many, if not all, of the First Amendment activities. Uh, so to try to address some of the concerns. All we can do is enforce the law. Yep, gotcha. Uh, all we can do is enforce the law. And that's uh, the question that came up about the Residential Tranquility Act. I saw in the email about stalking, and then we'll talk about the amplified uh, devices. So in reference to the Residential Tranquility Act, I think we all have to get on the same page that what they are doing is a First Amendment activity. Whether you wanna call it a demonstration, whether you wanna call it a protest, it's a First Amendment activity. What makes it unlawful is if they don't do it within the confines of DC code. So can we all agree that's First Amendment activity? 
Perfect. So there's three criteria that if they do any one of the three, it becomes unlawful. It's the time of day. They can't do it from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And uh, those of you that are paying attention, they're very cognizant of this because they don't start till 7 a.m. It has to be a group of three or more. And if you paid attention to them, they'll stand on one corner while one or two people go in front of the residence and demonstrate and they take turns rotating out because they're very cognizant of the fact that it has to be three or more. Uh, while they're in three or more, they can't wear a mask. And the last one, um, I just drew a blank on it, of course. Yeah, uh, two, hour, two hour notification. So MPD, when we respond, as soon as we become aware of it, we get our special operations division up there. There's a few steps we have to have in place. We have to give them ample warnings that they're violating the law and they're subject to arrest. We have to get the resources in place and then we can affect the rest if they don't heed the warnings and we have the resources to make the arrest. What we've seen occur more often than not is when we start giving them the warnings, they comply and they leave. Uh, so those are the steps we have to take to comply with the law. But as long as if it's one person or two people, they can be out there because it has to be three or more affecting the residents. When it comes to the stalking piece, I saw that in an email and we'll be touched on it uh, briefly, right? About being in fear, about having to leave the back of your house, not feeling comfortable. In the statute, the very I think it's the very last line, it says it does not apply to First Amendment demonstrations. The stalking statute, where it talks about this is a criteria for stalking, someone's in fear, so on and so forth. The very last line of that code says it does not apply to First Amendment demonstrations. So I go back to say, if we all agree they're conducting a First Amendment demonstration, we can't charge a stocking because the people inside the residence feel unsafe or feel uneasy or meet any of that other criteria in the stocking statute. So we have to abide by the statute. We can't waver from it and choose, you know, what part we want to enforce and what part we don't. So, uh, Well, no, well, but, but that's why I started the conversation. If, if, we, if we can disagree, we don't necessarily all have to agree, but if we all agree they're doing a First Amendment activity, then we can't enforce the stalking statute because in the statute for stalking, it says it does not apply to First Amendment demonstrations or First Amendment activity, I think it says. The very last line of it says it does not apply. So if we have someone saying they feel unsafe, they feel uneasy, they, they don't feel safe because these people are outside the residence, and we agree that it's a First Amendment activity, the stalking statute doesn't apply to that. I, I agree, but we have to, that's the discussion I think previously mentioned is the legislation may have to be addressed or changed. It's whatever the city council chooses to put in place and make the law of the District of Columbia, and then us as a police department can enforce those laws. But if you look at the way it's written and, uh, you know, uh, someone said it's poorly written, but nonetheless, if you break it down and digest it, uh, it is any one of those few th three, uh, any of those three things, because it says or, however, they have to be a group of three or more doing one of those three. And uh, they're getting savvy because there's down to one person or two people, they rotate out and take turns. No, no. So, so anytime we get a demonstration, anytime we get a call for a demonstration, it usually comes from the second district or a citizen calls 911, 2D units get the notification. They call our special operations division and we immediately head up here, but we have to have the resources to arrest 10 to 15 people. So it takes time, but there, there's two ways. Correct. If they apply through. These folks online can't hear the question in the audience. Absolutely. So, when you so he asked about if they apply for a permit for a First Amendment demonstration for 300 people, does the venue or location take into account? Was that your question? Yep. So, yes, it goes through a permit approval process, uh, and those things are taken into consideration. I don't think we've had one permit, maybe one we've had for a residence, and it wasn't for 300 people. 
But there's a second way they can make a notification, and that's via phone call or email or fax, I think the code still says, and that's within two hours of the demonstration. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, officer, uh, again, please tell the people online yep. what the question is. So he he asked if there's two competing and there's 15 in each group, so a total of 30 at one location, and they're, they're opposing one another. Uh, those things are st still taken into account. Again, if they're within the law, we're going to allow them to exercise their First Amendment demonstration. There's many demonstrations that we uh, assist with, allow people to exercise their First Amendment right. Uh, regardless of what their points of view are, regardless of what their objectives, and that might be just to keep them separated so there is no violence between one group or the other. GW University is one of many. I mean, but we face them daily, if not weekly, down on the mall, assisting park police at the White House. Uh, for every protest, there's counter protesters that have a different point of view and perspective, uh, and we allow all of them to exercise their First Amendment as long as they do it peacefully. Yeah. Uh, so her question was about blocking traffic and noise amplification. So they're not allowed to block traffic or sidewalks. Again, we advise them. Uh, we go through the warning process. And if they don't comply, uh, they're subject to arrest for the blocking as long as it meets the statute. Ampl amplification is enforced by Department of Buildings. And there's a very arduous process of just amplified noise, which is how many decibels. It's got to be inside, measured from inside a residence by a certified noise amplifying detector uh, and, and that's done by Department of Buildings. MPD does not enforce uh, the decibels because Amplified could be many different things, right? I know they use very loud devices, but uh, Amplified device could be very low as well. And I, I think, right, but the, the, the code is very specific. One, that's Department of Buildings. Two, it has to be measured by a certified device and it has to be from inside a residence. I think the closest residence it says uh, to, to be enforced and even then, uh, all those steps have to take place. Repeat what she said to the audience online. So, so her, her question is uh, essentially with the current legislation for you all to feel peaceful in your home, there's nothing the Metropolitan Police Department can do. I wouldn't say there isn't anything we could do because I believe we uh, changed our strategy a little bit this morning. Some of you may have seen it. We're trying to get spotters out of there ahead of time. So as soon as we see it get more than three, we start pulling the resources and getting the resources in place because we don't know if that number is going to grow from three to four or if it's going to grow from three to 50. Uh, but as soon as we see that they're in violation, again, we have to give the warnings. We have to get the resources in place. Uh, and if it comes to it, if they don't heed the warnings and they remain out there, we will place them under arrest. But we have to be in compliance with what the law says. And you, you all see what it says. All right, so his comments were about uh, people showing up and playing sirens at 730, running up and down the alley. It's not pleasant to the residents. Uh, there has to be change if you want additional enforcement. We have to comply with what DC code says. Uh, I know you all have uh, educated yourselves on it. We're very educated on it. It's a very careful balance between the First Amendment and it being against the law. But we know what that line is. And if they violate the law, we will take action. But like we have seen, and I'm sure some of you all as well, uh, they know the law as well. And that's why they start after 7 a.m. That's why they only have one or two people in front of the residence at a time while everybody else waits across the street, whether it be two or three additional people or five, 20 additional people, they know what the law is as well. 
But when they are in violation of the law, we give them the warnings, we get the resources in place. When we have the adequate resources, whether it be arrest five or 30, we will take that action. We have not gotten there yet because what I've seen every time uh, regarding residential First Amendment activity, we give them the warnings that they're violation of the law, they're subject to arrest, and they disband and, and leave. Uh, so like we did this morning, uh, I believe it's five residents across the city, not only the ones that y'all are familiar with, that are targeted on a fairly regular basis. Uh, we have spotters out there. As soon as we see them become in violation of the law, the notifications made to get the resources moving in that direction, and they're notified right then and there that they're in violation of the law. So we're starting the process much sooner uh, because you all can imagine getting some of these addresses at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning uh, could be time consuming. So uh, we have the spotters out there. We are gonna do, I think right now for the next two weeks, assess, reassess if we have to change our strategy and what we could do. So let's take the two last questions here in the audience and then one last question online. I think she had her hand up and then we'll come to you, Claudia. So her question was uh, First Amendment activity. She believes they have some sort of limitations. Some of the verbiage or things they say may be threatening another person and asking more specifically what constitutes a threat. So for someone to be threatened, they have to feel that the person, that they're one in fact in some sort of danger or unsafe, and the person is capable of carrying out whatever the said, said threat is. Uh, it does have to be a specific person. We have to have a victim. Uh, to say, yes, that person threatened me and I feel they're capable of beating me up, stabbing me, shooting me, whatever the case may be. But again, the threats doesn't apply to First Amendment activities. And if we sit here today and say they're conducting a First Amendment activity, it doesn't fall under the threats part of the stocking statute. Again, we're, I wouldn't say we're limited. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of laws that we do enforce, uh, but we have to follow the law. If you want to change the law for the better, uh, to go either way you want it to be more relaxed or you want it to be tighter then the law has to be changed and we will enforce it Let me, can i follow up on that when um and i understand what you're saying in terms of um, protected speech but i'm going to give you an example when i was on site on that monday morning um and meredith you had uh well you were probably down a corner i don't think you were there when this occurred but when the protesters broke up they absolutely became very aggressive to the neighbors that were in that adjacent, you know, right on the street. So they are, and I'm not good with direction, but they were moving towards Utah. What's the major Barnaby street, Barnaby street. Okay. So they were moving down towards Barnaby street where a group of neighbors were congregated, not saying anything to them. And I was amongst them one of the protesters came up to the neighbor and I almost interjected. As, as a matter of fact, I did interject because she put drumsticks in his face, very close to his face, maybe about here, said some threatening remarks, including some racial slurs and he was white. To me, there is, I understand about the protests, First Amendment rights, when they're chanting and things like that. But in an instant like that, what I saw is moving a, 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 a transition from, you know, protected speech 
into very threatening, aggressive behavior to where somebody is pointing drumsticks, yelling, screaming, and calling somebody, you know, threatening words and, and racial slurs. Um, so in, a, in an instance like that, and what I fear in situations like that, obviously is the escalation. Because we had a community that's been dealing, this, dealing with this since June. The protesters have been out there that long as well. Um, where, where does MPD draw the line with that? Because I was very afraid, very afraid that she was going to, you know, get too close to this gentleman who was a pretty big guy. And then if he did something to her, maybe he's going to be in trouble. But she put those sticks in his face like she was going to pop him with the sticks. They could hear your question online, right? Because you have a microphone. Yeah, they can hear me. Okay, uh -huh. I just want to clarify. So in that instance, that, that would, without knowing more about the exact verbiage, but that would be a threat. That person no longer is a protester, demonstrator, acting within their First Amendment right mm -hmm. to demonstrate and protest. They are now a citizen walking down the street, making a threat. 911 should have been called. That victim filed a report. Officers come, do their investigation. And uh, if the elements of the threat are met, then a threat report can be taken. And there's further action because we see some of these repeat actors that are on these scenes. Right. So we might not know her today, because I think you refer to her as a her. Right. But it doesn't mean we can't identify her in the future. There's a second sighting where the victim says, that's the person that threatened me four days ago. And here's the report numbers. And even if the officer can't make the arrest, can at least stop and identify her. And then the detectives can apply for an arrest warrant. So okay. in that circumstance, if the criteria of the actual threat itself has been met, they're no longer under the guise of the First Amendment demonstration. Okay. They're, wa they're walking back to their car. Yes. They're by themselves. They're not actively demonstrating. I would right. say that's not protected, and you can't walk around threatening people with drumsticks. Got it. But okay. the call has to be made, and the victim has to say, I felt threatened by this person. This is what they said. This is what they act like. And the report can and should be taken if the elements of the actual threat itself have been met. Got it. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Let's go to Claudia and... Um... Then we'll go online and we're going to have to wrap it up. Yeah, I agree. So her uh, question was, how is a noise violation enforced if it's DOB and DOB is not a rapid response? Um, the, the code, the legislation says DOB is responsible for enforcement. So again, it's one of the legislative issues that might have to be addressed if you show choose is to have it changed. Uh, years ago, I think probably all of us in the room have 20 plus years on, MPD did enforce it uh, to a point. And then it went to, I want to say DLCP now. Uh, and 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 now it's at Department of Building. So those have, have a resource, and there's strategies, right? We did it, we've done it on U Street, we did it in Adams Morgan, where we put together a noise task force uh, on the midnight shift to address some of the nightclubs, and we go out, collective agencies together, and address the noise issues that are coming from some of these nightclubs and bars and have the appropriate agencies. So there are a means and a mechanism. Again, are we getting department buildings out there at seven in the morning or two in the morning, or does the legislation have to be changed? I think there's opportunity for improvement, uh, but unfortunately MPD can't do it because the legislation says we can't. So your understanding, so it's 60 decibels uh, and is the noise threshold in, in a residential neighborhood to my recollection. <laughs> 80. And so if they're exceeding the 80 decibels, are, are you, is someone measuring decibels out there so we know what the decibel level is that it's, that it's not exceeding we, we, it? We, we are not. It's got to, it's got to, it has to be measured by Department of Buildings. It has to be with a well, certified device. But that's what the legislation says. No, no, I understand that. I'm just, I'm just I, I used to represent this, the community for creative nonviolence. We were arrested all the time for, for, for protests under um, disturbing the peace um, mm -hmm. types of, of statutes um, during the old corporation council days. Do you not have some ancillary authority for taking action even in the context of a, of a First Amendment protected speech 
demonstration if they're violating noise resolution noise regulations and it therefore constitutes disturbance of the peace so during the first amendment demonstration to the best of my knowledge commander bagshaw can correct me if i'm wrong noise amplified devices do not apply for a first amendment demonstration so if they're again in the act of demonstrating the decibels and, and, and all that goes out the window where i think it could be enforced is when you have the two people out there with the bullhorn and you were to get DLB out there to do the measurements because they're not demonstrating at that point, right? Because only two, maybe that, that that could be applied there. But if if they're have, using a noise amplified device during a First Amendment demonstration, it's not applicable. Okay, and last question, let's go to Trish and then we'll come back to you for the last question, Brian. All right, I'm gonna be very quick because I'm gonna stick to this noise amplification because I personally have applied for a number of First Amendment permits with MPD, and they specifically ask you if you're going to have, you have to, like, it's part of the permit that you have a noise amplification. And I, I, I'm going to be doing some research into here, but it just seems mind boggling to me that anyone who is exercising their First Amendment rights in the District of Columbia can have any kind of noise amplification. I mean, they could have a a concert level sound system under what I'm hearing here and just be blasting whatever. I, I just, um, what's the point of requiring for permits noise amplification if you don't need a permit for that? I guess right. that's not so, a question. I'm just well, frustrated. Well, well there's, there, there's many questions and criteria when you apply for a permit. But again, we're talking about people that have not applied and don't provide that information. But just like we ask about the number of people and start time and end time with along with all the other questions is for the permit approval process, but these people are not applying for a permit. And they have two people. Okay, and last question, Brian. Because they, because they only have two people. Right. It sounds like they have 10. They do. Yeah, they do, they certainly do. Around. But in front of the house, No, they do not have to notify us. Uh, they usually uh, make us aware, uh, either by some sort of insignia they're wearing, uh, which ones are planning to get arrested, which ones aren't planning to get arrested, who are the media relations people, who are the law enforcement. They're very organized in the larger demonstrations. Um, but no, they're not required to notify us, but they usually give us a heads up, hey, the people with this insignia or, or this marking uh, plan on being arrested or are willing to be arrested for their cause, whatever that cause may be. Yeah, there's a, when, when they do the organized demonstrations, you'll have the law enforcement liaisons that have certain markings, you'll have the medics, you'll have the uh, media folks. Uh, and then again, people that want to get arrested or don't want to get arrested. Uh, we saw that at GW as well. There, there's a handful of them that we gave them warnings and uh, the people that don't want to go to jail, uh, get up and leave. And the ones that are planning for it or, or, or want to go to jail for their cause, they, they get arrested for it. Got to be the last one. Anytime you feel unsafe, even during a First Amendment demonstration, you should call the police. We, we don't want you to feel unsafe. What, what I hope we conveyed or we have a better understanding is what we can and cannot do to address your concern. It doesn't mean the police aren't coming. It doesn't mean because you have a demonstration in your block and you truly feel unsafe in your residence because of what they're saying, how they're acting, who the players are, whatever the case may be. I never wanna say you feel unsafe, don't call the police. It's just hopefully we uh, set everybody's expectations of what the law is. Hopefully we all understand it now we're on the same page anyways. We could agree or disagree with it, but what the law allows us to do, what the law allows us to enforce, uh, and, and we will respond. But at any time you feel unsafe, call the police. If they're not acting within their First Amendment, they're not demonstrating, they're no longer a demonstrator or a protester, and they threaten you, call the police and have them do the investigation. And if the elements for a threat are there and assaults there, 
uh, we will take the offense report and it will get assigned to a detective to investigate. Okay. All right. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on your agenda, Kathy, we had you down for 15. Can you reduce it to 10? To, as, <laughs> as much as you can reduce it? I'm going to defer to Commissioner Lynch because he wanted this on the agenda. We could also put it on November. I mean, the other thing is. What, what would work better for you, Ms. Patterson? Oh. Ms. Ms. Patterson's here. I think we scheduled this, we asked for it uh, a long time ago. I think you should go ahead with it and uh, we'll figure it out. I hope. I also think in, I support that and in relationship to it, we've got. Put your mic. It is on. We can't yeah. hear you. Close to you got to get close. We, we've got. You got an hour. We've, we've got, got an hour of business in 15 minutes. So it we, just is not going to fit. I, I mean, understand that. So what I guess one of the things that we talked about online is we've got three Zach Ferguson um, conversations and one Bruce Sherman. I'm perfectly happy to have a special meeting that takes up all four of those, let this play itself out. And then we'll set a, we'll set a meeting sometime in November and, and, and hear all, all four of these things with some more time to deliberate on. So she can start talking. Well, I want to be in this Go on. You want to introduce the topic so she can get started? If we're discussing what's bold or kept on me. We're not. He okay. just, I'm not. I'm trying to introduce her so she can get started. Oh my God. Okay, Ms. Patterson. So Ms. Patterson is the um, director of DC's Office of Audit. I must say, I'm such a fan of yours. I love that if you guys do not follow our audit office, and I'm a geek because I come from an IG community, but I know the quality of y'all's work. Um, so I just want you to know, I have been following you for a long time in your office for a long time. And I really respect what you guys do. So um, Commissioner um, Lynch wanted to have um, her present on her most recent audit um, regarding MPD. So needs improved data analysis, target de deployment and more detectives. If you can give her overview and she's passing out um, the handouts for that. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. So when I started the job almost 10 years ago, the, um, my team was look, starting to look at patrol services, which is the largest um, part of the police department, um, and looking at the police department as one of our largest agencies. We did, um, when we issued a letter report in 2017 on that, we found in a very, very small sample, let me just say it was a very small sample, that the patrol officers spent 22% of their time on calls for service. That's a very low number. Most departments, it's 40%, 50%. You think if you're a patrol officer, what do you do? You respond to calls for service. So we began recommending, um, in that letter report, we began recommending a major time utilization study of the police department, and even recommended working with the department to put on a study like that. I had a couple of conversations with um, Chief Newsham that didn't go forward as a cooperative uh, venture. Um, but one of the things historically that we do know is our department has had more officers per capita than most departments. There's a 2003 chart in this um, from the Judiciary Committee showing that we had a, you know considerably more police than other jurisdictions of similar size. This was 2003, so we're talking quite some time ago. There was another study done in 2012 um, for Mayor Gray, also looking at the de department and suggesting that um, maybe this needed another look. Fast forward to 2021, the Police Reform Commission also recommended looking at doing an audit of the police department, although their recommendations were really to look at roles and responsibilities more so really than just numbers. So in 2022, we put out an RFP and um, got five responses. Four of these responses were very, very competitive, and they were uh, major consulting firms that had a lot of real-world policing experience, people who had been chiefs or in other senior position within a department in the country. And we looked at all these proposals, these four proposals. We had 
four of my senior staff and two representatives of the Metropolitan Police Department look at these proposals, rate them, and we selected a contractor. Um, they took almost two years, 18 months, two years to do this study based on um, a form of looking at numbers and police departments developed by a couple of professors for the COPS office at the Department of Justice. So the, the study methodology that they used, and I only brought one copy of the final report, but I'm happy to, to auction it off whoever wants it, 400 pages. So I don't know which one of you want to keep this. Um, so the findings of the report, we were, it was published in September. Most of the headlines on the report basically were that we were saying the department doesn't need any more officers which is a real oversimplification of what we concluded. So a couple of the conclusions from the report were patrol services, the largest division, probably had an adequate amount of officers assigned given the calls for service and given all the other requirements and pressures. The detective forces, not so much. We found that the detectives across the city needed probably 35 or so more detectives to meet all the need in all the jurisdictions. And the charts that I handed out show you some of the breakdown by district of what the recommendation and the study um, format um, did show. I'm, I'm really trying to go through this quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but probably the most important finding of the report I think is that we need to know more, the department needs to analyze more, it needs to collect more data. Because when, when the findings were that maybe there were enough officers in the patrol division, that was based on probably not as much data as should be had. And some of the pressures that the, the commander and other commanders in the other districts will tell you, the pressures on patrol services are to pull people off their patrol duties to go take juveniles out to New Beginnings out in Maryland, mm -hmm. or to take individuals from the jail to a hospital. And the general orders require two officers per jail transport. One of the things, though, the department does not do yet, although they've pledged to do it, is to know exactly how much time duties like that take. So when you're pulled off for a hospital detail or you're pulled off for a juvenile de detention detail or you're pulled off for a demonstration, you're pulled off for some of the First Amendment activities, the department does not have the data to say exactly how much time that takes. So that's one thing the department said they will be continuing to work on. They do have the IT technology. They just need to use it and analyze it. And the conclusion in the report is that we need to know better how much personnel we need in our department. We need to decide what it is we want them to do. We have a lot more First Amendment activities in this community than other cities, but we also have a lot of things that we don't have our department do. A lot of municipal departments have to do, provide security at airports, we don't. Our police are not now doing forensic sciences, that's a different department. So one of the recommendations is, what do we want? How do we put the right responsibilities into the right hands? And what does the community want that to be? Who do you want to, how many duties do you want the individuals who are sworn and who are enabled to carry guns? What do you want them to be doing? Do you want them to be directing traffic? Do you want them to be doing other duties? So the bottom line, I think in this report in the last page and then what I handed out said, it's not one and done. You don't study the numbers and say, this is what we need forever and ever. It's a community iterative process. It's a process of knowing what the numbers are today, knowing where our officers are deployed. We know how much overtime is work because we know how much we pay, but a particular typical patrol officer on patrol, on assignment, we're not quite sure how that individual spends his days. And the formula in this study it based on a theory of for it's 40, 40, 20, 40% 40 on calls for service, 40% on self-initiated activities by officers and 20% administrative work. And this is something with which the Metropolitan Police Department leadership agrees. But then the, you know, the, the proof is in the numbers of how you then do deploy and how many officers you need. I think our department has been used to having a more maybe than a lot of other departments, and right now they don't. And so they feel the pinch, they feel the inability to reach into patrol to pull people out for the things that they need. And I, I'm sorry that the commander wasn't able to stay because it would be great to get it into some back and forth. Um, anyway, those are the major findings that we need to keep the community talking about what you want officers to be doing. And we need to push the department to do a little bit better with its data analysis. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, one thing that came up through the debate on staffing is the understanding that there's so many other departments in the city. How should people view the relationship between all those other departments, agencies, and uh, the staffing at MPD? In terms of who does what? Who does what and whether that offsets MPD's role or taxes MPD, uh, what, what did you find? I think when way back when, um, when I was on the council and I chaired the Judiciary Committee, we were pushing them for civilianization, taking positions and work that office sworn officers were doing and handing it over to civilians. A lot of that has happened. We have, I think, 200 traffic control officers at DDOT today, but we've never gone back to MPD and said, okay, well, maybe we need to subtract 200 you know, positions. No, we, we haven't done that. We also don't have as many folks in civilian positions at MPD as other office, other departments do. So these are some of the things we need to keep working on and working with the leadership to say, what is most appropriate? What do you really need to be sworn to carry a gun in order to do? And I think, and again, I think that's something for, for you all who are elected officials and the community to really continue to say. I know some of the progressives and some of the folks on to my left got a bad rap for talking about defunding the police, but the point wasn't defunding the police. The point was right work in the right hands. Who should be doing which work? I'm not necessarily defunding the police. Maybe they need, in fact, more money to do more different kinds of work. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I think there, there needs to be a continued debate of who does what. And I know we do continue to use police sometimes for traffic control in some circumstances, and I'm not quite sure where the line should fall between MPD and DDOT on that, for example. You, you said there were some challenges with the data in the report, and I think you just mentioned it. What are some outstanding questions that you have that you would like to explore more? In the report, and one of the things I did mention was exactly how much time our patrol officers spending being pulled away from patrol. When, when I'm an officer and I respond to a call for service um, that comes through the Office of Unified Communications and the 911 system, that is part of the computer data dispatch. Someone knows that I'm officer, whatever my number is, and I'm going to this, um, this event. And then when I'm back on duty and back available for another call, they know that amount of time. That was that 22% on calls for service that I mentioned at the outset. But how the rest of the time is spent, we don't really know. And yet we can. So whenever I you know, reach into a patrol, um, into a PSA and pull somebody out to go transport someone to the hospital, we can track that. And MPD has pledged in their response to our report, they've said well, they were, will set up the system to begin tracking that. So they can then come back to the council and say, now we have a better sense of how much time we are pulling people away from patrol services and we can really do an analysis and better manage that. And maybe they can come to the conclusion that maybe we, we, maybe we don't need 4,000, maybe we only need 38, whatever the numbers are. So that's what, that's what I'm hoping for, to see a lot more data and a lot more analysis behind it all. Sure. Did you all touch on and explore the issue of morale uh, on the force and no. what that looks like? No, the, the staffing study was strictly that. It was looking at how time is spent and, and then also yeah. benchmarking in comparison with other jurisdictions. We are doing another project right now that council required us to do, looking at, this doesn't really get to morale so much, but looking at um, hate group influences within the police department. You might've seen some news about this a couple of weeks ago. That's a project that we're working on right now. And last one for me, did you all uh, explore how, how much personnel is directed towards uh, undercover work and how much money goes towards uh, informants at all? We did not. We did not look at that issue. We looked at patrol services, but we also looked at the investigative services division, the detectives, and that's where the study, again, using the, the models developed for the Department of Justice, that's where the study said we do need more assigned, more detectives assigned in the investigative services, but it didn't look specifically at undercover. Yes, sir. Um, 
I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm sure we do have information about that. And we know we know how much we are spending on overtime and we know how much we get reimbursed from the federal government for some of the things that are federal. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. That's something that I can try to get for you. I don't know that we got overtime numbers from the benchmark departments. Um, we looked at other roles that they played, but I don't know that we got their overtime numbers. Um, so I'm sorry that I can't answer that specific. I know our overtime is way more manageable today than it was when I was on the council 20 years ago. We had an awful lot of court overtime then we really scaled that back, scaled that back through much better management. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Commissioner Zelda. Just on a going forward, thank you very much for this thank and for your service for all these years. You have, to Lisa's point, been a model of public service. So thank you for thank that. You. Um, what can we on the ANC, how can we best partner with you, if if at all? What what can we do to be supportive or provide information or be eyes and ears and in outcomes based on what you've You've well, written. Let, help us develop our work plan. What are we? What should we be looking at? What What is really on your mind, and what's worrying you? We did a survey of ANCs. I hope some of you participated in it um, about a year ago to help us with our planning process. Um, we, I, I joke with people that we do projects at two paces, slow and much slower. It does take us a while. Audits do take a very long time, as Lisa knows. But but it's helpful to know what the community thinks we should be looking at. We have probably, I don't know, 10 or so projects going at any given time, sort of beginning, middle, and end. Um, but we want to be we want to be doing the right work. I mentioned the police department, right work in the right hands. We want to be doing the right audits too. So what what is of concern to you and your constituent? I, I would really very much like to hear that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you very much for being yeah. here. That was awesome. Thank you so much. So commissioners, I have a, it's 845. Do you all want to call a special meeting or would you both yes. be in agreement with doing a special meeting yes. to take up Commissioner Nash's agenda item, Commissioner Sherman's agenda item, and Commissioner Ferguson's agenda item? Is that a yes, commissioners? Yeah, or? yeah but can we make it after the 5th? No, I'm just, I just want to, we can, <laughs> we can set a date. I just want to get y'all's okay. Are you okay with that, yeah. Bruce? Okay. Commissioner Ferguson, are you okay with that? Yeah, if, if it's the date that I have extenuating family circumstances in November, I don't know how many commissioners are, you know, appreciative of that, but I, I'm happy to try to make it work. Okay, so we'll do that. Um so I want to move real quick to commissioner's business, commission business, because we do have some really important um, items in the treasurer's report that we need to get a vote on. Um, commissioner Ferguson, do you want to do the 2025 proposed budget? And this kind of goes to, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Steve? Steve's question about what we spend items on. So we're approving the budget now. Um, and that can change because you brought up some good suggestions. But do you want to go and get a vote on the budget? Yes. And let me bring it up on my screen. Um, and for background, um, we do have a significant amount of money. I've been hoping we could spend it. Um, we've been asking the community for grant ideas. We have grant programs, but that can be challenging. Uh, let me share screen. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can all see the budget. Um, yes. pr proposed, this is a proposed budget for next year. So as I was saying about our um, funding, um, it's the OANC is recognized. It's kind of hard for ANCs sometimes to spend money. There's a lot of rules. We've had projects that couldn't be go forward because there are strict rules about what you can and can't spend money on. Uh, and even when we, you know, we've had a couple grants that have not worked out. Uh, one OANC rule was not eligible. One, um, the SUFA sign project, they didn't get the public space permit. So we went through all the 
the process, but had to get the money refunded back to us. Um, so it's, you know, we, we urge the community to come to us with ideas for grants and things that would benefit the community as a whole. Um, so yes, we're sitting on a lot of money. So here is the proposed budget. Um, this can always be amended later. It's not set in stone. It's really aspirational. Um, you know, it's not saying you have to spend this. Um, so I sent this to commissioners a while ago and uh, just, I put some um, amounts in different categories on based on how the money could be spent or likely to be spent, you know, and again, if the commission next year feels differently, they can change it. You'll notice we have no money for personnel and that's because that's for full-time or, you know, dedicated employees and not contractors. I think we've more ANCs have been going the route of hiring contractors rather than, you know, uh, employees. Um, so that's why you don't see any money in personnel. Um, but otherwise that's our budget. Um, and I would move that we approve it pending um, discussion uh, and questions. A second. Any discussion, commissioners? Okay. Zach, could you just point out what we uh, earmark for what we're going to have to get to in the new term, which is hiring an office assistant? <laughs> um, so these categories are a little bit vague. So I think you could put um, that under um, a service, if you're hiring someone to could do a service, you could hire it as a direct office cost um, if they're doing communication. So um, personnel, though, I checked is just for employees. So if you decide you want to uh, employ them, which comes with a lot of uh, diff you know, complexity um, to uh, you could you could move money over to personnel. But otherwise, I think you'd pull it from. Uh, point of service, you have $15,000, or direct office, you have $10,000. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Let's pull it from the budget categories and amend it. Any other discussion, commissioners? Okay. Um, so the vote is on the uh, FY25 budget. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Um, motion is approved, Zach. And do you want to do the discussion and vote on the FY24 fourth quarter QFR? Yes. Uh, so we need to vote on this to get uh, allotments for upcoming quarters. Um, this is the first page of the QFR. This is the quarterly financial report um, for fiscal year 24, quarter four. This is um, backwards looking. So we spent about $4,500. You'll see we also deposited uh, some money because that, again, was the, the grant that didn't work out. Chevy Chase Main Street reimbursed us. And we also got some money from Zoom because it was, uh, we, we now, I think, DC pays for Zoom and we got some money um, given rebated to us. So my next page, I'll you'll see the exact communications um, expenditures. So this is uh, the quarterly transactions, and these are mostly our typical um, expenses. You know, the website is through GoDaddy. Um, reimbursements to me are for uh, our contractor. Thank you very much, Luis. I, I've got money uh, reimbursements for our PO box, for our website. I paid out of pocket. Um, we use MailChimp for the ANC list uh, newsletter. And then the big expense you'll see is for, um, I think that was a deposit towards the website redesign and fixing it. Um, that's not the full amount. I believe that's either, I can't remember if it's a third or half. Um, so that's the large payment is website uh, help. Um, so those are transactions, if anyone has any questions. Uh, but pending discussion, I move to approve the uh, FY24 quarter four uh, quarterly financial report. A second. Commissioners, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand. Seven zero. All right. Thank you, commissioners and community members. Um, we will post when our next special meeting is so that you guys are aware. We'll definitely give you the seven days notice. If it's we can we'll try to give you more than seven. 
um, because holidays are coming up. So we, we know that you guys are going to be doing stuff as well. But we'll take up the discussion with Commissioner Nash on a transportation survey, the ANC authority issue from Commissioner Sherman, and the three resolutions with Commissioner Ferguson. So with that, I call the meeting adjourned. The time is 8.50. Thank you so much for your patience. Please put Thank up you. your chairs. <laughs> yes, please put your chairs up. Thank you so much. You okay with that, Jim? Sorry? You okay with that?